It's my pleasure to welcome all of you to the Joan Kroc Distinguished Lecture Series here at the Joan Kroc Institute for Peace and Justice at the University of San Diego. My name is Joyce New. I am usually the executive director of the Institute. Uh, this year I am on leave um, from the Institute and am a senior fellow at the U.S. Institute of Peace in Washington, D.C., but I'm delighted to be back after two weeks away. Um, and um, am here for the conference that launches this evening and then we'll return to Washington and leave the Institute in the very, very capable hands of my colleague Dr. D. Aker, who is the interim director for 2006-2007. This year marks the fifth anniversary of the dedication of this beautiful building that you are sitting in. Um, so five years ago, we were busy getting ready to dedicate this facility. We now have five years under our belt, and I think quite a lot to show for it. And one of the ways you can see what we have to show for it is, in fact, by walking around, looking at some of the photographs on the walls to see the different events that we've done. And more, I think, is to talk to some of the people in the audience who have taken part in different activities at the Institute, either international activities that we've been engaged in or local activities in terms of our outreach. And so we are very thankful to all of you who've been our partners for the last five years, and we look forward to having you as partners, uh, certainly at least for the next five years, uh, hopefully a, a great deal longer. Um, welcome. I know that uh, Joan Kroc, were she here today, would be really delighted uh, to see you all and to see um, the people who have been coming to the Institute over the last five years to learn about a world at peace as opposed to a world at, at war. And unfortunately, um, uh, when she was dying in, in 2003 was when the war in Iraq was launched. And even then, she was on the phone calling some of our elected officials to basically tell them they would never get another dime of her money if they voted for the war in Iraq. The men and women who are with us this evening and for the conference embody the spirit of Susan B. Anthony when she said, cautious, careful people always casting about to preserve their reputation or social standards never can bring about reform. Those who are really in earnest are willing to be anything or nothing in the world's estimation and publicly and privately in season and out avow their sympathies and bear the consequences. We have a wonderful audience here this evening of very brave men and women. And again, Joan Kroc would be very proud and pleased to see these people because she certainly was one of these people who spoke out and actually put her money where her mouth was, which is a lovely change. Um, one such earnest person who is an outspoken advocate for human rights and women's rights in particular is my colleague Dr. D. Aker who will be moderating the panel this evening and so I want to introduce her and just say a few things about her because most of you know Dr. Aker um, but you may not know a few things about her. She has been a very staunch advocate for women's rights and women's voices going back more than 20 years. She has documented women's stories as an international correspondent to the Women's Times in San Diego as well as being the producer and host of her own program on commercial television which included two 236 30 minute interview and documentary programs on women for KUSI television here in San Diego. These interviews now form part of an oral history library on women from around the world. Dr. Aker, the interim director of the Institute, as I mentioned while I'm on leave, is the director and inspiration behind the Women Peacemakers program and behind this conference. Dr. Aker is a psychologist and anthropologist with experience in the field and in the classroom. She was a Peace Corps volunteer in Colombia. She raised rabbits, I believe. Um, I'm not sure how that experience has applied to her current work. We, we could maybe ask her. Um, and she has received numerous awards for her service to the San Diego community. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Aker, who will introduce our panel this evening. Thank you. 
I'd like to welcome all of you to the Distinguished Lecture Series panel, our first actual panel, on women, war, peace, and the politics of peace building. It's a privilege for the Joan B. Kroc Institute for Peace and Justice at the University of San Diego to be able to bring you a very special evening. We're gathered on the first eve of a conference in which women and men have come, many from the front lines of peace building and peacemaking in Africa and Asia and Latin America and Europe and elsewhere, to examine how we can be a real activist, a real policy maker uh, for a voice for peace with greater justice. This is about the politics of getting women to the peace table with men and the politics of what must be done to keep them there and the politics of peace building, what it might really be like with greater awareness that people who live on the front lines and suffer the consequences of policies they had no influence in, if they were there, how this would be different. The urgency of this task is felt by many of us, certainly all of us on the stage, many in the audience this evening. And we are spending a lot of effort to have gender inclusive peace building and peacemaking be heart and soul of what we propose would end some of the complications. We look at a world of growing militarism, of powerful, negative, human rights denying legislation rising radical fundamentalisms, and an increase in poverty because of economic policies that had bottom lines of the few rather than the right to a decent life for the many. And as all of us in this room know, the faces on the TV, the bodies of our human community, murdered, raped, trafficked, abused, and just even the use of the word genocide so commonly now suggests that there's something wrong with the policies that we currently have. Who's making policy? What difference does it make? Some of us who have been privileged to learn from real peacemakers on the ground, those survivors who stay and work and find out how to bring communities together that have been long separated, they're teaching us. And we want to make sure that their voices are heard at the table. 30 years ago in Mexico City, the first UN uh, World Conference on Women was held. Actually, most of the delegates were men. There were more men than women. Uh, but what happened at that conference changed life for a lot of people because women saw and had a chance to present their issues, and it really became a calling. It really became something we could put our minds around and look to, uh, changing. So women took seriously the questions raised at that conference and discovered there were a lot of common things that they had, no matter what country where they were from, uh, what country they were from, or how uh, things were moving forward. Uh, and so they met and they continued to examine what was happening in their societies to women, to families. They looked, did it in Copenhagen, they did it in Nairobi 10 years later, and they did it region after region, nation after nation, until uh, they had honed and articulated clearly and lobbied for some ch real changes. Woven into my own attempts to document and support the change that will bring about some kind of gender inclusive voice to the decision making tables um, are the women you'll meet this evening. Mary Matembe, whose bio you have, I'm not going to go into long bios because we'd rather hear them. Um, actually welcomed me into war ravaged Uganda 20 years ago. She was on the ground organizing from the NGO, moving right into government, moving forward, becoming the Minister of Ethics and Integrity once she helped write the Constitution, uh, and really was active. And she, at the very beginning, had to go off as a delegate for her government to Beijing. She goes to Beijing, and who should have organized the people in Beijing uh, but Irene Santiago on, the far, on my far right who was the executive director of the NGO Forum. There were 30,000, 35,000 people there from around the world at that point in time. And uh, she represented the Asia group, but had, it's hard, you know, but it was exciting and it was real and it changed a lot of things for all of us. Beijing came out with a statement. We called it a platform for action. We articulated points, specific points that we wanted to work with and look at. And uh, one of the things five years later from that is how we weave in Alma. Because Alma Perez 
is going around, she's been very active in something called United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325. I know we hear a lot about resolutions, but this is really a very important resolution. It says women have to be at the peacemaking tables. They have to be there after conflict has ended. They've got to be involved somehow. And so Alma is moving forward and taking forward the work that's been done over the last years. But with that, I would love to introduce Irene Santiago. She was the executive director of the uh, Beijing NGO Forum. Irene. Thank you. In hindsight, 1995 was a good year. Uh, I didn't think so at the time because uh, the massive political and logistical nightmare that was the NGO Forum on Women in China wore heavily on my shoulders. And as you can see, they're not very big ones. <laughs> but we pulled it off. 30,000 participants, 500 events a day for 10 days. So the NGO Forum on Women 95 was the parallel event to the governmental Fourth World Conference on Women. What was remarkable about Beijing as we call those twin events, was as much its process as well as its products. The product, D said, is the Beijing platform for action. But more than that, as I said, there were 500 events every day for 10 days. So you can imagine what products there were and what processes were going on. And it is these that we must build on and must, must continue to build on. The Fourth World Conference on Women was preceded by five regional conferences in Asia Pacific, Europe, the Arab region, Africa, and Latin America. In each of these regional conferences, NGOs mustered all the resources that they could in order to run parallel forums that served to give women a stronger voice at the governmental conference, certainly, but also enabled us to network closely across issues at the regional level. So finally, when we got to Beijing, there was a strong women's team called Equipo that grew organically from the regional process. We can truly say that the Beijing Platform for Action, with its 12 strategic areas of concern, was a negotiated document not just among the governments, uh, among the governments, but also between governments and the women. It was a hard fought struggle as the forces that would keep women's voices and concerns out of the UN document were formidable. As the governmental conference deliberated on the platform of action, the NGOs also organized plenary sessions around five themes. They had identified five themes as having the highest impact on the largest number of women worldwide. These were, one, globalization and the impact of the technological revolution on work. Two, violence against women, including increasing militarism. Third, all forms of fundamentalisms, religious, ethnic, geographic, homophobic, etc. Four, governance, including issues of identity and citizenship. And fifth, homogenization of culture and communication. Well now, it is 2006, and it is not a good year. 9-11 and terrorism, the invasion of Iraq, the increasing numbers of protracted social conflict in the world sit on top of those five themes we identified in 1995 and have either raised new issues or sharpened their impact even more. As we deliberate here for the next two days on gender inclusive decision making for peace with justice, where are we at specifically in the politics of peace building, which is the issue this panel is supposed to address. A few months ago, I was in a forum where a man from the Ministry of Defense of an Asian country I shall not name, 
asked me, Irene, we are talking about war here. Isn't it a diversion to be talking about women and peace? I have very expressive eyebrows. <laughs> <laughs> so you can imagine what they expressed at that moment. Of course, I said that I couldn't believe I was hearing that question in a public forum in this day and age, but I was. Didn't you hear the same thing, the same question asked by the people, usually men, but not only them, in the labor movement, in the agrarian reform movement, in every liberation struggle? You wait, women, wait. There are bigger things to fight for. Then I said, dare I say the P word? Patriarchy. Oh yes, we used to use that word in the 60s and the 70s. And slowly, we stopped using it as we talked about women and development, women in development, gender and development, gender mainstreaming, and so on and so forth. We forgot the P word. Patriarchy is about men's obsessive need to control. Isn't that one of the reasons for war? And if that is so, shouldn't we be talking about women and men? About gender? He didn't ask a follow-up question. <laughs> and then another man said, I am afraid to ask a question in case I am labeled politically incorrect. And I said, yes, you are right to be fearful. <laughs> being, being scared is the beginning of awareness. So apart from the forces of patriarchy, <clears throat> there are forces of fear and forces of want that together make violence an option for many. And that is why Muhammad Yunus and Grameen Bank winning the Nobel Peace Prize is good because it tells us that peace must confront all those forces, patriarchy, fear, and want. If peace is to be for all and therefore sustainable, Muhammad Yunus, an economist and a man, believed in women. He knew that the forces of want and fear can be reduced, if not eradicated, by giving women a chance to choose to empower themselves. He made the connection for peace as did the Nobel Peace Prize Committee. Eleven years after Beijing, we have learned about the politics of peace building. Why are women still not at the table? Why are we not making the decisions? We have worked on quotas. We have done endless training and organizing. We have instruments, we have modalities, we have tools, we have all that. But my colleagues on this panel will give you concrete situations and issues arising from their practical experience in the front lines. Allow me to be the philosophical one. If you want the practical me, you can come to my panel tomorrow, <laughs> tomorrow night. Uh, where I will speak about my own experiences as a negotiator. But tonight I want to talk about politics, meaning power. After long years of reflecting on power and women, I have realized that we must start where the women's movement has always started, with the word. In the beginning is the word. Because if you can't name it, you can't have it. Remember, personal is political. Remember, women's rights are human rights. We had to name them. 
How many of us have seen women who are excellent community organizers desist from entering the public arena where bigger decisions are made? Not that we don't have the skills. Sometimes we may not have the experience in that public arena, but that doesn't stop the men, usually. So why won't we go? So why won't we go? Because power in the models that we see every day is not the power that we want to hold. We see power as manipulative and deceptive, even violent. But what about this? If we define power another way, would women claim it? Power is the potency to act for what is good. There are three operative words here. Potency, act, good. If you have the potency, you don't act, you are not powerful. If you have potency, you act, but you act for what is not good, you are not powerful. It is capacity, action, values. If power is the potency to act for what is good, would women claim power? That's not a resounding yes. <laughs> would you claim that kind of power? Yes. Yes. Our challenge in the peacekeeping, peacemaking, and peacebuilding field for women and men both is to model that kind of power so that the person who struts to the meeting with his guns and his bodyguards and his arrogance will not be called powerful. He will just be called evil. And we will stop asking his kind to be a graduation speaker or a sponsor at our daughter's wedding. <laughs> so at the table, at the top, where decisions are made, we don't need just any woman or just any man. We need leaders and managers who are steeped in notions of gender equality, human rights, and social justice. When we have women and men like that, our world will be rearranged, rejuvenated, transformed. In our quest for this type of world, we need to create an atmosphere of hope. Paulo Freire, that great Brazilian educator, once said that one of our tasks is to unveil opportunities for hope, no matter what the obstacles may be. Without a minimum of hope, he says, we cannot so much as start the struggle. But without the struggle, hope dissipates, loses its bearings, and turns into hopelessness. And hopelessness can become tragic despair. Hence the need for a kind of education in hope. I have been an organizer for most of my adult life. I have learned such things as begin with the people but don't end there. No one empowers anyone else. Only you can empower yourself. And the potency to act for what is good is real power. And it applies not only to peace, but to everything else. Salam, peace be, be, be with us all, in and out. Thank you. Thank you, Irene. Um, gosh, if you'd had more than uh, half a day to write something, I don't know what we'd do. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. No, I mean, what you're saying is very true. And we're ready to move on to someone who's actually working with that, one of those resolutions that may uh, help to empower us because it's about being at the table and bringing good to the table. So Alma, would you like to talk about yes. your experience? I won't. Hope. Hope is what we have. but. Hope is what women had in 2000, and that was a good year, if we talk about one. 2000 was the year of the Millennium Development Goals. You remember that? Microphone, is it on? You're with me now? Thanks. Then 2000 was also the year that women made 
such an achievement in the United Nations and in the international arena. They got a resolution of the Security Council, all for them. And uh, I was in New York in December 2000. I was appointed at the Colombian Mission to the United Nations as a diplomat. And when I came in to that room, my first thought was, what a masculine place this. <laughs> I honestly, I thought that. And I have read a lot on it. And there is the Security Council, the place when you decide evil and good, when you decide war and peace. And um, probably because of the energy that they got in Beijing when women movement had to fight for their place at the table and fight for their visibility in papers. Because everything in the international arena is about papers. It's about treaties, it's about resolutions, it's about declarations. And we used to think that all of those papers had nothing to do with the real life. And when you go into the Security Council, then you realize that the paper from the Security Council certainly changed a lot of people's life. Well, what happened that year was certainly amazing. Women's organizations were able to craft a resolution of the Council. We were able to lobby that resolution and were able to make that resolution accepted and issued by the Council. And that was a landmark thing. And Resolution 1325 is not just any Security Council resolution. Any Security Council resolution, it's mandatory, as you know. Any Security Council resolution should be enforced for every country member of the United Nations. But it's also a mandate for the whole United Nations system. Every agency in the United Nations has to comply those resolutions. And 1325 just plays in that framework three words, women and peace and security, all together. Hmm? So it was the first time that we had the visibility of the United Nations Council Security Council recognizing that peace and security are inextricably, inextricably linked to equality between women and men. And that sounds quite normal for us right now. But try to lobby a text into the Security Council saying so. And it would take ages. And it took, and they did. Since that year, 2000, Resolution 1325 has been the framework in which the United Nations and the countries are moving and should keep continue moving to enforce several mandates, and I would say four basic mandates of them. First, it is that women should play an active role in peacemaking efforts. That means negotiations. That means political decisions. That means implementation mechanisms. Not every woman, but yes, those women that are working in the communities, those women that are part of women movements, those women that are, that are able to get this paper, an international resolution, and enforce it. So first mandate. Second mandate, protection of women in conflict situations. And the resolution calls specifically for protection of women's rights and addresses specifically gender justice. No peace without justice to crime committed crimes committed against women. How often peace is made against such crimes? 
-hmm. Third point, mainstreaming a gender perspective into peacekeeping operation, and I would say into every operation United Nations is carrying on in the field. You're normally say, you're normally told in the street that the Security Council Resolution 1325 only apply for those countries into the Security Council agenda. I have been told that in Colombia so many times. That resolution applies to all countries, to all of us, men and women, to all governments. And we should be able to make it real. And the last but not the least area, it is inclusion of a gender perspective in reports and implementation mechanisms. How many agreements, how many declarations do United Nations have on social issues, on economic issues, on development issues, and women are not specifically there? What is not named, it doesn't exist. You cannot count it, and you cannot ask for it. Hmm? Well, but Resolution 1325 is not important just because it has all of these mandates on it. It is important because not only women movements were able to make all the lobby in order to get the resolution through, but they are also doing the lobby now to keep it alive and to make it implemented. And no other Security Council resolution has such a vibrant civil society movement behind. And I really believe that 1325, it's, it's a living proof that civil society, that the person like you, like, like I, that the person like my mother in Santa Marta, Colombia, can touch international reality and modify it. These people were able to draft a resolution for the council. And now they are being able to enforce that resolution. This is something that normally we don't think we should be able to do, but we do it. And um, now what we have, we shape the international agenda. We have certainly achieved six years after that, that the United Nations has included women in every possible space. We are being named now. We, are, we have gender chapters in most of the reports that the United Nations is issued. We, we have achieved quite a lot. We have more women in places of power. Some are gender aware, some others are not. But was it? Was that what we wanted? Because I haven't seen that change, that people looking for that kind of power she was mentioning. And we have been with 1325 for six years by now. So point is, we were able to shape international processes. We were able to shape international language. You see how politically incorrect is not talking about gender equality now, but try to make it real. That seems to be politically incorrect. Hmm? And you're going to sit on the table, don't the people stare at you still? Like you are the only woman at the table? Try. Well, point is, it's time for the national agenda. If we were able to get 1325 from the Security Council, this robust women movement that was able to do so, it's also now, it is the time for them, and it is the time for all of you women and men to start the implementation of what means of the spirit of Resolution 1325 at home. And at home means at your country, at your region, at your neighborhood, at your place. I've been delivering trainings on 1325 these six years. No, I have to say that that first thought the Security Council changed my life. I went back to Colombia and I started spreading the word. And most people don't even know on the topic. 
But when they, when they know that, the feeling of empowering is such a feeling that they are able to do big changes. I recently addressed a conference in Guatemala, Central America, and a group of uh, women and men peacemakers over there on 1325. And there were women and men saying, well, I need to go back and I need to start doing training on this because now we have an international instrument that we can comply with as a person. So my plea would be go home, get the text, or to start reading about that. Start asking. When you start in a place and there are no women at the table, ask for it. Even if you are a grown person, even if you are an adolescent girl and you go to the school, why are no women in the school council? That is a point. And that will be the beginning of you building real power, not just any power. So we all have a duty to do. I thank you. For those of you who, are, who will only be here this evening, there are copies outside of key points of the UN Security Council Resolution 1325 and also the Beijing Platform for Action, the, the primary tactics. But of course, you can always find it online. It's real easy to look up those two things. With that, I'd like to go from the international to the national, to someone who actually helped shape a constitution that tried to deal with these issues, Mary Matembe. Thank you so much. Is it on this? Yeah. Thank you. yeah, I would like to welcome you from Beijing through New York at UN and back to Africa in Uganda if you have ever been there. <laughs> I would like you to cast your mind to Africa and uh, listen to me a little bit. I, I just want to thank my colleagues for this uh, wonderful, especially a humorous <laughs> presentation. <laughs> I just want to say that I, I've been a politician for the last 17 years. From Nairobi, the forward-looking strategy through Beijing, Beijing 10, and here I am to share my experience with you. You will observe that all these meetings had these three words. If it is a platform of action, it is a platform of action for peace, equality, and development. Peace begins because it is clear that without peace, you cannot develop. develop. And without equality, you cannot have either peace or development. You know, being a politician, I've been confronted with questions as to, you know, but why should women participate? They must justify why they should participate in politics. And I say, shut up. Why should I? <laughs> the, you know, the fact that I'm alive and a human being and was created by God to exist side by side with a man is clear evidence that I must participate. We shouldn't be asked the data to justify why we should participate. The fact that God saw it fit when you created man. By the way, God created man after creating animals. What missed in the animals he put in man? <laughs> and what missed in man finally he put in a woman? <laughs> and he was satisfied that this is now a complete job of creation. <laughs> and the whole, <laughs> the whole idea was that man should sit together with women and decide the issues of governance of the animals and the rest of the things God put here. And the fact that we are missing this world because women are denied the opportunity to participate and influence the decisions. You can imagine even at peace negotiation and peacemaking, putting all these men seated there, men who know how to make wars, and now they sit there and they want to make peace. Don't you see it is just a contradiction? And why they can't see it is what I can't understand. <laughs> and that's why God had created a woman with a sixth sense to tell them, 
And distinguished men, I wish you could listen to us, the world would be different. Now having said that, I would like to say, <laughs> I would like to say that in Uganda, having emerged out of wars, dictatorial rules, and murderous regimes in 1986, women had become clever. We had suffered so much that when the democratization processes start, started in 1986, we said this time we must be in there. You've not done good for us. And good enough, the NRM government was very receptive. It was listening because the women had participated in the wars also to bring it into power. So they said, fine. And the NRM established institutions, democratic institutions, and charged them with the responsibilities to democratize the country. And one of these institutions were the Uganda Constitution Commission. And that commission was charged with the responsibility of putting in place a new constitution that would make a new Uganda. And good enough, because we were alert, we said we need to be there on this body also. The government appointed two, two women out of 21 member commission. Don't worry, I was one of those women. <laughs> two lawyers there. And I can assure you by the end of the constitution making exercise, all those men seated there, the, 20, the 19, were very gender sensitive. And in fact, some of them found their way into the constituent assembly, which promulgated the constitution, and they were really talking for us like they were purchased or something like that. But of course, they had been influ influenced. You see, if these people were to allow us to sit with them, even at these peace negotiation tables, peace could be reached quickly, because women know the language. You can imagine, you know, you know, you know, God gave us the responsibility of not only mothering the human beings, but nurturing them. You know, has it ever occurred to you that it takes, a, is it one minute to make, to make a baby? I don't know how many minutes, scientists know. <laughs> I don't know how many minutes, but it can be a second or a minute, but both man and woman participate equally in that second or minute. But then after that, the, the whole thing of human creation and nurturing is left to the woman. Nine months, that human being is communicating to you, and then on breastfeeding, and then on nurturing and bringing up. I mean, we know human life more than they do. And I wish they could <laughs> let us, I wish they could let us make decisions that concern human life. And that's, if we sat with them on the tables, I'm sure they would change heart, and maybe things would change. Therefore, really, we must be there. So for us in Uganda, we said, look, we must participate in this constitution-making exercise, and for sure we did. We did a great job. I see, I see you with that book. All that is certainly documented in this book. Therefore, five minutes given to me will not do anything. <laughs> but I want to tell you that we embrace the constitution-making exercise because women looked at this constitution as their savior. You know, they thought it was the panacea to all the problems that they were involved in, the problems of battering, inequality, all this kind of thing. Therefore, we participated fully. We really organized and participated. And as a result, we came out with a very wonderful, gender-sensitive and responsive constitution. All the provisions, I'm not going into them, you can ask me if you want, but this constitution came and the exercise coincided with the Beijing. In fact, by the time we went to Beijing, we were in the Constituent Assembly discussing this draft which had come out of the, of the public because the constitution was participatory made. Particip Popular participation method was used in making the constitution. And the women used this method as a way of gender sensitization. And therefore, when we came, whatever we had in Beijing, we said, aha, uh -huh, Beijing has already decided. And since we are signatories to CEDO, we must incorporate all these things. So eventually, we came out with this constitution, wonderful constitution. And as a result of this constitution, 
which guarantees affirmative action and equal rights and many other things. The women in Uganda are participating in politics with good percentages. I mean, 28.8% .8 in parliament is not so bad compared to, to America. <laughs> the scent of civilization and all power. <laughs> And, and of course, uh, in the cabinet and other decision, high decision making positions, the percentages are between 20 and 30. And in local government, it is 30%. And we have the principle of gender balance, which demands that in appointing people to positions of responsibility, <laughs> you must balance. But you know, we use a defective measuring. What do they call these balance wing machines? Ours is so defective that if a commission is, for instance, seven people, then two are women and five are men. And if they are four, one is a woman. And the balance is tilting this side. But it is better than, than nothing. So I, I, I'm just telling you that we have all this. Politically, women are participating. But if you want to know more, come tomorrow to my session where I will be presenting. <laughs> with all this energy, with all this enthusiasm, with all this high climax of Beijing and getting the constitution in place, what is happening right now in as far as equality, peace, and development is concerned? We shall talk about that tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs> Let me ask um, Irene particularly, do you think that the kind of energy that produced Beijing and the platform for action, or the kind of energy that actually created the constitution of Uganda, Mary, can that ever be regenerated? Is it possible? What do we need to do to do that? Hope. You have to hope, D. Um, the, the energy that led, that was so palpable in, in Beijing is, I think, has been taken over by, by what I call technical people. You know, the, the whole dynamism that came from a movement, as we go into gender mainstreaming, it becomes technical. So, so people who know about modules and, and um, uh, training and checklists, etc., get into the forefront because now you're trying to gender mainstream. So it becomes a technical problem. And so the technical people come. And, so the, and, and there is a difference between movement, a movement and, and the technical side of things. I am not saying the technical side of things is, is, is not good, but I think, I think the, what I call the incandescent impetus, yeah? That's, that, 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 that is what I think is lost when, we when a political problem becomes a technical one. And, and I think we've, we've sort of gone uh, into that, and I think that a balance now, as again, you know, a balance needs to be made, and and therefore, I mean, I'm 65 years old, okay. How many how many of the young people are here in this room who are going to take over the movement? I think I think most of us are now thinking successor successor generation, uh, who must come up with their own issues. They are not the same issues as our generation, but they have to come up. And, and, and define their own issues again. But I think um, we must not lose sight of what a movement is and what a movement can do in the rush to doing the technical side of gender mainstreaming. Well, I, I just want to say that um, we need the younger generation to be motivated and not to get into complacency. Because for instance, me, at this age, I don't think I can have that spirit. You know when you met me 20 years ago? Can I really revive that? But I think my daughter or my daughter-in-law out there has got to be provoked 
or challenge to move on. And of course, environment and circumstances are very different. And I do believe that those people whom we took over from were also talking like that, maybe at that time they had reached some level of, of climax. So we need to really challenge our young people, both men and women, to, to come up and, and take up the mantle. Um, Irene, we have a question for you. Uh, since the Philippines has had women presidents, has there been any benefit? <laughs> it doesn't have to be one woman. <laughs> Look at the eyebrows. <laughs> the eyebrow said it. I just wish that that question were asked in public. Um, Corazon Aquino's role was to restore democracy. And, and she did, in a very brilliant way. Uh, we asked her to become a president and she was not, she had not been prepared to become, to, to lead a country out of a crisis. Uh, but her legacy of having restored democracy, the only, the only candidate that everybody could, ra to, could rally around, uh, uh, that is her place in history. No? Um, Gloria Macapagal Arroyo, uh, the current uh, president has been repeatedly asked to resign um, and will not resign. Uh, so that is the crisis, in, the political crisis in the country today uh, in that um, she's been accused of cheating in the elections and lying afterwards. Sounds familiar? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so but, but, but that is also, I mean, as I said, I did, I've done a lot of reflection on, on women and politics. I've, myself, I've run for, for, for public office. Uh, I ran against her in uh, 1998, and I, so I keep telling the people in Vietnam, if you had voted me for president, then, you know, we wouldn't have, yeah, so, but that's, uh, that was, that's a joke. Um, um, so, so, but, but in, in my reflections, that's the reason why I said what I, what I said, that it's not just any woman. It will have to be men and women, you know, steeped in the notions of gender equality, human rights, and social justice. If you don't have those, what kind of a leader are you? No matter what your gender is. So, so we're, ta we're talking of, of, of human, I think, of, of human qualities. When we, I, I, I do not like to romanticize, romanticize women as the nurturers. I really, I really don't. Uh, because I think it does a disservice to women and to men and, and to human beings. Uh, because I think we should do better we should do better in, 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 in the way we, we raise our, our children. We have to also do better in the way we structure our society. And, and, and that it doesn't have to be, you don't you have to keep saying a, a woman is, as I said, is, a woman is not an angel because when they, you know, if you get, uh, if you get uh, Indira, um, Margaret Thatcher, then you're saying what happened. Uh, but, and it's just not fair, I think, to, to put that burden also on women and to put that kind of also of onus on men. Uh, and so those of us who are, working, who are working on peace, in fact, are starting to think in terms of what, what do we teach, what values do we teach, so that we see each other as, I, I'm going to be spiritual here, um, as souls. And whatever we're, roles we're, we're, we're playing are, are costumes. So if you're now your mother, your wife, or your husband, you're a public official, you're Muslim, you're Buddhist, those are all costumes. In the end, each one of us is a soul. 
And I think it's the only way I can see another person. I can see another person in peace. I cannot have conflict with such a person if I see that other person is a soul. I can have conflicts with that other person in the different roles. And as we keep playing those roles, especially because you, those roles are played within uh, uh, isms, the various isms that we have, then it becomes the source of conflict. So go home tonight, think. Think about the roles that you play and how those roles result so many times in the conflicts we're in. And if as, as husband, wife, as mother, daughter, as, you know, all of those things. And just if we could just see each other as souls than everything else, I don't think there will be the conflicts that we have today. Of course, you say, so what else is there, Irene? Well, there's happiness and, and, and peace. And I think if we, if we start thinking that way, then I think uh, many of the things that we are all to want to achieve in this world, we can, in fact, achieve in this life. Thank you. Thank you. I think, I think that that's a good note for me to be able to say thank you to all of uh, these three lovely people. You've been around the world with different perspectives. Um, I would like to really thank all of our volunteers who made this possible, and especially Diana Cutlow, who is in charge of the Distinguished Lecture Series, and Denise Strands, who's volunteered and has been working around the clock to, to help make uh, this all work for us. We're going to have reception outside. You'll get a lot of questions answered that you haven't had a chance to, uh, to I didn't get a chance to read them just because of our time limitations here. And I want to thank each of you for uh, joining us. And please join us in, in the um, rotunda, and we'll, have, so we'll share something together. Thank you. Thank you.